Well, everyone, I'm standing in the middle of downtown Kabul, where I just uh, experienced the first uh, half of our day on day one of the uh, Dr. Leo uh, beekeeping class, keeping bees in horizontal hives. And I got to tell you, I'm very impressed. I had a feeling I would be because I've been so blown away by the videos I've seen of him on YouTube and the book that he's uh, translated from Russian into English, Keeping Bees with a Smile. And um, even though I've kept bees for a long time and I've learned some from really good people, uh, third generation beekeepers to be specific, so I've, I've been privileged in that way and I'm really grateful for that. But I'll tell you what, the knowledge that I've picked up today um, has really enhanced uh, my whole beekeeping experience and I can already tell I'm on a whole new level of beekeeping so that's great I mean that's what the, this journey is all about so I'm looking forward to the the second half of our uh, class today which is going to be a hands-on or at least at the apiary where we'll be able to see some of the bees at Dr. Leo's uh, apiary so um, that's the um, update so far and um, I'm having a blast. This is this is my Disney World. You know, when you get to be, uh, you know, when you grow out of being a kid, uh, you know, Disney is the thing when you're young, but when you get older, it's the life experiences in life's journey that really make it. And uh, this has definitely by far been a great one so far, and I'm sure that the rest is going to be amazing as well. Uh, Dr. Leo does not disappoint. If you've uh, been able to uh, attend one of his lectures or meet him in person, um, he's a very good teacher, so I highly recommend uh, his class and his books. So that's all for now. Uh, we'll see you at the next update. Well, this is the long-awaited uh, visit to Dr. Leo's uh, apiary and his class that he held in Kabul, Missouri. And I've been anxiously awaiting uh, getting all that footage edited for you and to uh, make that uh, available for content that you can check out. So I want to just kind of go over some of the highlights of this uh, journey because that's what it was. It was a really cool uh, beekeeping experience. I always tell people that when you start keeping bees and you start meeting other people, uh, like-minded individuals who are keeping bees as well, um, it's really a, a gateway and it opens up so many doors and um, brings you closer to nature. It brings you um, closer to uh, thinking in harmony with how the bees work in nature. And so what I want to do is just uh, kind of highlight the trip a little bit. Um, when we left uh, uh, our area of northeast Georgia, we're about an hour north of Atlanta. And uh, we mapped out a route because it looked like there was a huge weather system that was moving across the southeast. And Alabama is one of the ways that I could have taken to get to Kabul, Missouri to see Dr. Leo, but they were getting pounded by some thunderstorms and it looked pretty severe. So they were forecasting up to three inches of rain uh, within just a short amount of time and so I thought you know what let's just take um, 85 North and so we did and we went up through um, Chattanooga Tennessee Nashville we went all the way up to Paducah Kentucky where we crossed the Ohio River and also the Mississippi River it's kind of one junction where the two rivers come together now the cool thing was is the trip itself was pretty uneventful and that's what you want for a road trip you don't want to have any um, crazy experiences on the road. You just want it to be a nice, calm, easy ride. And for the most part, it was. We had uh, a drizzly, kind of rainy day, but nothing too crazy. It wasn't that hard to um, drive, because sometimes the roads can be slippery if it's really coming down. But it was just kind of a light, misty thing. The one thing that I didn't like about the route that we took was there was a ton of semis all over the place, semi-trucks everywhere. It seemed like it was more than half of the vehicles on the road or semi trucks and uh, that was the one thing I, I don't care for because they seem like they weave all over the road and, and um, uh, I don't know I just don't feel safe around them and in particular there was this one uh, situation when we were getting ready to cross the bridge and I don't even know what the name of it was uh, I didn't see a name posted uh, when we crossed but I want to show you this this was probably the one part of the trip where I got a little bit nervous 
The bridge that we crossed the Ohio and Mississippi rivers was being worked on. They were rehabbing it or something, so it was down to one lane. It was a two-lane bridge, it was down to one lane. And there's a, a wait to get on and cross the bridge because they can only let some cars go from each side and everybody's got to take turns. So this side gets a turn and you wait 10 minutes and then the other side gets a turn. There's this huge semi-truck in front of us and we're coming up the ramp to get onto the bridge and this thing is shaking. It's bouncing up and down and it literally feels like it's moving a good one foot uh, up and down. Every time the cars and trucks cross it, you can just feel the whole bridge doing this. And I'm like, what are we doing? Do, do we really want to cross this bridge? So here we are waiting to cross the Ohio River on a single lane bridge and this thing is bouncing up and down, literally. Every time a semi goes over, this thing shakes. Yeah, it's like, do I really want to cross this? So I, obviously it was, it was safe, but it didn't feel safe. And the semi truck is in front of us, and here we go, it's finally our turn to cross the bridge. And they have these concrete sections that are probably about 20 feet long on the bridge and there's a crack between each one. It must be where they pour these uh, concrete sections. And every time the semi passed one of those uh, cracks, it, it was boom, 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 and it felt like the whole bridge was gonna come down. And I told my wife, she's driving, I said, do me a favor. I said, slow down and just back off from this guy because I have a feeling he's going to take down this bridge and if we're too close he's going to take us with him. <laughs> so I didn't like that one bit the whole time and it seemed like it took forever. This was a long bridge and uh, it seemed like it took forever because it just felt like this whole thing was just shaking so hard with this semi truck in front of us every time we'd cross over one of those concrete cracks. So we made it through that, thank goodness, everything was fine and uh, from then on the trip was pretty uneventful and we actually passed through that giant weather system. Uh, we, we were only in the fringes of it, but by the time that we got into Missouri, we had a beautiful sunny day. In fact, the entire weekend was above average temperatures, so it was really nice, and we got a special treat because of those warm temperatures um, during that weekend. So we were pretty excited about that. Now, when we went to Missouri, we actually left on Thursday so that we could kind of get our bearings on Friday and maybe do a little sightseeing, and that's exactly what we did. Now, we wound up staying at the Comfort Inn Suites that Dr. Leo recommends if you go to visit his class in Kabul. It's literally 10 minutes from where he holds his class, and it's given five stars on uh, the reviews. I think it's, I don't know if it's Yelp reviews, but um, it's a, it's a five-star rated hotel. And it really was nice. And uh, despite all the COVID restrictions and so forth, um, we enjoyed our stay and uh, we had a nice time. And then all day Friday, we just had time to go and do some sightseeing. And so we uh, went to uh, the Noblet uh, Lake Recreation Area. And that's in the uh, Mark Twain National Forest. And that was one of the recommended go-to places if you have time uh, to visit and kind of see the area. And so we did and we, we went there and we went to the campground area first, but at this little camp spot, we saw something really cool. As soon as we stepped out of the car, we looked down on the ground and it looked like a little chipmunk. And it's not, it's actually a caterpillar. So if there's any entomologists out there that can identify this particular caterpillar, uh, feel free to put it in the comment section below. I'd love to know what this little critter is. Now, he was real small. He was about the size of uh, your pinky finger, or, or smaller. And he had a little face on him, and it looked just like a little chipmunk. It looked like somebody took a pen and ink and drew a little face on this guy. And he was the coolest looking thing. And uh, we were just checking him out, and, and I took pictures and a little bit of video just so that you could see uh, that this thing is for real. Because sometimes when you look at a picture, you're like, oh, you can't quite get your bearings, but he was tiny and my wife kind of moved him with her foot. We didn't hurt him or anything, just so you know. She used her shoe to move him, but we didn't step on him or hurt him or anything, so he's fine. Hopefully he's turning into a moth or a butterfly somewhere right now. And um, I just thought he was cool. So um, if you know what he is, 
I'd love to hear uh, from you experts out there because I am not an expert when it comes to caterpillars and, and uh, all that. I know what a monarch butterfly is, but that's it. That's my area of expertise right there. Uh, so next, uh, we went to Noblet Lake. And here is Noblet Lake, and it is so beautiful. So if you love nature and taking in the sights and sounds of the peace and tranquility uh, in these kind of remote places, because that's how Missouri is. It's very quiet. Um, it's very sparsely populated. So even here in North Georgia, because we live close to Atlanta, we do get a lot of visitors on the weekends to a lot of our parks and recreation uh, areas. So, but here in Missouri, uh, there's not that many people that are going to zoom in to one spot. Uh, there was maybe just one other person there uh, just for a short time. And when we came to the lake, I I'm just going to pause for a minute and just let you take this in. This is all you could see in here, which is absolutely breathtaking. And you could just feel your body decompressing when you're in a, in a spot like this. Absolutely gorgeous. I highly recommend if you do get a chance to visit, you make this one of your stops. There's also a nice uh, little dam that uh, flows down. Uh, and you can see this here. There's some fish in the water. I think they were trout. Uh, I'm not an expert on fish either. And, uh, but you can see a lot of fish swimming in the water. Um, there was a lot of flowers in bloom this time of year and so my wife was gathering some flowers up for a little uh, bouquet and uh, just kind of seeing all the different varieties that are out there and we even found some uh, honeybees visiting some of the flowers so that was kind of cool and these have to be wild honeybees because we are out in the middle of nowhere um, you, you don't see very many houses at all so unless one of those houses was a beekeeper there's a good chance that the bees that we saw here uh, we're living in a tree hollow somewhere, which is kind of cool to find uh, honeybees living in their natural habitat. Another uh, spot that we visited while we were in the Noblet Lake Recreation Area it was just a nice little park setting. They had some picnic tables and benches, and you could just kind of take in the uh, sounds of nature once again. And the leaves were just starting to fall. This is the early part of fall, and uh, where we were in Missouri, it's a little further north than Atlanta, so they're ahead of us as far as the beginnings of the seasons go, uh, at least with the cold weather. And so the leaves were just starting to fall, and I just got a little bit, bit of video footage here, the yellow leaves that were starting to come down. There was a lot of pecan trees uh, planted in this particular spot, and so the leaves were already starting to turn. And you can see in the video here that I took that these leaves were just starting to come down, and it, and it was just so cool watching them with the sunlight. Um, so th that was just our, our day of relaxation. Now the next day we had class, and I'll just uh, cut into that a little bit. I obviously can't, uh, we, we couldn't film the class, but um, here's just some things um, that I'll share with you from the experience. Um, we were able to do a half day class in the morning, and then the second half of the day after lunch, uh, we actually went to Dr. Leo's apiary at his house. And so here's just a little bit of the footage of us uh, traveling. We're in this massive caravan all the way over to Dr. Leo's. We're on our way to Dr. Leo's apiary. So this is day one, part two of his session. So it's a long ride and I hope I don't get lost because the uh, cell service I have isn't that great out here. But it's beautiful. We're having a warmer than average day for this time of year. So I'm really uh, looking forward to getting out to the apiary and checking out Dr. Leo's bees. See the master at work. So he's out there and I was worried that if it got dark, I might be uh, either camping somewhere <laughs> near Dr. Leo's or, uh, or I might wind up living in Missouri. You know, uh, there's a joke, I guess, when you get out, out in the country like that, uh, the reason why people live here is because one day they took a drive and then they couldn't find their way home, so this became their new home. And I said this could happen to me today. But um, here's uh, Dr. Leo, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and cut to some of the things that um, uh, were highlights of Dr. Leo doing a hive inspection. In fact, uh, Dr. Leo did three hive inspections 
in his apiary at his house. And I'll just cut to some of the footage and let you enjoy uh, hearing some of the things Dr. Leo had to say, teaching the students uh, as he's opening up his hives. And these are, again, these are the Layens style hives that a lot of you people are fans of, so check it out. You will, may not notice it, but for them, they start releasing the alarm pheromone that will stay there in the hive for two, three days after you are done with your inspection. Now, the release of the smoke uh, sends them the signal that there may be a wildfire around and they start paying attention more to this potential danger than to some in, in, uh, intrusion. So actually, the release of smoke is more gentle on the bees than just opening it with no smoke whatsoever. So I always have the smoker going. If I need to give them a puff of uh, smoke, I have no problem with that. Also, when I use the smoker, as you will see that uh, when I'm sliding the frames back together, there may be bees between the frames that may be squashed. So giving just a small puff of smoke along the frame causes them go down and then I can slide the frames without crushing a single bee. The same can be accomplished by wiggling the frames a little bit just to give them a sense that the passage is closing and then they get out of the way. As fate has it, I'm using pages from Keeping Bees with a Smile <laughs> just to start the fire. That's why you need to buy more than one copy. <laughs> All right. Uh, for the fuel itself, once the fire starts going, you can use even uh, cardboard. A very good uh, fuel is our burlap. Uh, just make sure if you buy used coffee bags that it says certified organic on the bags. Because if the, if the bags were used for certified organic honey of uh, coffee, they are not allowed to treat it with fungicide and other chemicals. But the conventional coffee beans can be coming in burlap that's been treated with all kinds of chemicals uh, to prevent it from getting mold in it. All right, so the history of this uh, colony. It was a swarm caught on this tree last year. They survived the first year. I took 25, I need to go in the, uh, in the nose, but I think I took 25 pounds of honey off them last fall. And this year I took three artificial swarms uh, from them. Meaning it's almost like punching down the dough. They keep expanding and filling this box. And when I see it's completely packed with bees and honey and brood, I just take half of the frames and I put them in a separate box and take them two miles away so foragers cannot return to the original box. And then they are knocked down to basically an artificial swarm because they became smaller, they have fewer bees. Uh, and uh, if I took the queen with the split, I don't find the queen for this procedure, then they'll raise themselves a new queen from any eggs that are there because whether it will be an egg or a forager, uh, and queen or a forager is not determined by genetics, by but by nutrition. So I just split them in half, making sure each half has eggs and the young brood to rear a queen from if they have to. So they're not back to maybe seven frames, and this, I add more frames and they start expanding. And this one was a very prolific colony this year. So I punched them down like that two times, taking two swarms off of them. So made four colonies out of one, three or four, I need to, uh, yeah. And uh, now we'll see uh, what they grew back in. Oh yeah, and I also harvested uh, four frames of honey from them in August because they were already full. In August, when I discovered that they ran out of room, uh, it's already too late to make a split. Some people still do it, but it's such a late split that by the time there is a queen, it will already be September and uh, small hive beetles become very bad uh, in late summer. So they just have smaller chance of survival, so I don't make late split. July is when I will make my latest split. So if a hive runs out of room in August and I detect it on time, instead of splitting them, making an artificial swarm, I'll just take the surplus honey that's starting to choke them and give them some uh, empty frames of the extraction or even just frames with foundation so they have room to expand. So this is the story of this uh, uh, colony. So when you open the hive, as I showed on the pictures, there is this, uh, you know, feeling of calm. The bees that are here are very few that are exposed and they don't mind me opening the box. I know that the brood chamber is here. Now that the temperatures are warm, 
Uh, sometimes you cannot tell the difference, but even today, if you put your pump hand here and then over here, you'll feel the difference in temperature. Which one is warmer? This one here. Yeah, exactly. So this is where the brood is. I can tell by just how much warmer this is. And in the spring, when the air is cooler and it's cooling, the other frames are faster. It's really palpable. You can tell where exactly the brew chamber is. You can use the, one of those uh, thermometers, infrared thermometer. You could, absolutely. Much so you see my marks here of uh, like the year and what I added, E for eggs, F for foundation, what I saw in these frames, just remind us for myself. And right here we have 13 frames, but the last one is just foundation. I always put more foundation than I think I will need because if I miscalculate, and they have too much foundation, nothing bad will happen. If I didn't add enough frames, they will start building from this cover, going into it, and then when I leave the cover, I will leave the comb. Uh, so I'd rather avoid this problem than giving them too much foundation. Okay, so here's the first frame. And many times I, I will be taking them out to show you, so you don't have all to be close here to see what I'm seeing. But normally I don't need to take the frames out uh, I'm just picking down there and I'm sliding in like that, like reading pages of the book. But over we go. So here is one last frame, which is foundation that they didn't build out. They start drawing it out. Uh, as you see, there is a lot of propolis here connecting this to the previous frame. Uh, I love the stuff. I always just put some into my mouth and chew on it when in the bee yard. It clings to your teeth and makes talking more difficult though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then I can put it into my uh, propolis box. Okay, so this is the very last frame that has very little activity, but it is all right. Uh, it, if anything, it serves as a curtain for helping them maintain the mic. Lens frames, there is just something so beautiful about them as opposed to the Langstroth frames. You take it out and it's just the feeling of rightness. When we come to the to the brood, you'll see they're able to make this very rounder uh, brood pattern as they are programmed to do in nature. That was a full sheet of foundation. Yeah. <clears throat> so you sp you pry it there loose, and then you slide it out, and then you lift it. Don't just leave them like that because uh, you will be crushing and rolling many bees. Oh yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. See. Okay, we have kept honey on this side and they're still working on the other side. And this is why normally I would be doing the harvest uh, in uh, late October or November, one month from now. Because what is nectar now, I cannot pull this frame because it's still work in progress. But uh, uh, in one month time, this side will be completely uh, um, covered over and sealed and I will be able to uh, pull it. What's the end of your season? Uh, yeah, everything really starts shutting down with the first frost because it kills the flowers. Mm -hmm. And the first frost here may be anywhere from mid-September, but it's exceptional. Normally it's mid-October, but we've seen it as early as mid-September and as late as maybe December. Okay, about helping the colonies. When you have a small hive like that, you may think, oh, very likely, like you can come up and you can try the weight and you can tell that's not a heavy hive and you wouldn't expect one that's a late swarm, a small swarm to have a lot of reserves. So you may be tempted to feed them, even just grabbing a frame of honey from another hive and give it to them. If I were to do it, I wouldn't do it right now. Mm -hmm. Because what you do now is that all the other hives are very active and there, if we go into a dearth, meaning if there is no flowers or with nectar, then the bees from the other hives will try to rob other hives if they are empty. So if this one doesn't have too many reserves, yeah, they're not starving. They won't survive the winter with what they have, but at least right now they're not attractive to robbers. So if I were to support them and feed them, I would just grab a honey later when the other hives become dormant and then I will give it to them for their winter food. This way I avoid the risk of uh, robbing and I also avoid the risk of them being this, uh, uh, killed by the small hive beetles. Because when you introduce extra honeycomb there, you are upsetting the balance between the number of bees and the amount of comb that they need to clean and protect. 
So I've killed more than one colony by wanting to help them. I would give them a comb of honey from another colony and thinking, okay, they can use some extra food, not realizing that I'm also giving more opportunity for the small hive beetles to proliferate. So again, for these two reasons, avoiding robbing and not giving small hive beetles too much ground to run on and to lay eggs in. If I were to give this colony some extra food for the winter, I would do so after the first frost, when the other hives become much less active and small hive beetles shut down for the winter. After the first frost, small hive beetles won't bother them. They may still be there, but the temperatures are low enough and when the colony stopped rearing brood, they don't have to maintain 95 uh, uh, degrees in the brood nest. The temperature drops, but the small hive beetles come from Africa. So they're tropical pests, and when the temperatures in the hives drop for the winter, their larvae cannot develop. So it will be safe to give these bees some comb from another hive a month from now. But now I really wanted to show you what, how a small swarm looks like within uh, a month of being taken off the tree. So here are the original six frames that came in the swarm trap. And as you can tell, compared to the other colonies, that there are barely any bees inside, which is something to be expected, because when they move as a swarm in, they start making all of this comb and the queen will start laying eggs. So now they will have the first generation of eggs becoming adult bees. But in the meantime, while they were building the nest, all the old generation of bees have, have been dying out. So there will be this dip in the population, which makes it even more difficult for them to withstand the invasion by small hive beetles if you were trying to strengthen them by giving extra calm and honey from other hives. You said you caught the swarm a month ago? A month, I, yeah. A month, yeah, a month ago, late August. Okay. So my latest swarm I caught was mid-September. So I will be pulling my swarm traps down. I never leave them for the winter for two reasons. Uh, you won't catch a swarm in the middle of the winter, but they will be out in the weather. So you'll prolong the life of the swarm trap box by putting it in storage for the winter. And the second one, late in the season, all kinds of other critters like wasps making nests there. They don't seem to move in in the beginning of the summer when the honeybee swarms emerge. But late in the year, they may move in, so it's a good idea to take it down and before you deploy the following spring, you will still want to open and make sure there is no ant nest or wasp nest there. So you will need to do it anyway, so I do it in the fall, put it uh, in my shed for the winter and then I will hang them in April. So because your climates are different, the basic rule of thumb that swarming usually starts when the first flowers really start blooming, plus six weeks because six weeks is the time that it takes from the egg to develop into an adult and then becoming forager so that they become very, very strong and have their sources to swarm. Okay, so just a fr frame of foundation and then here is a foundationless frame with the dowel. Okay, very light. Uh, I see there is a uh, nectar there very lightweight meaning they don't have much nectar but there is some nectar in some of the frames uh, cells so I if I were to give them any food now I would give a frame that has very light colored comb so there is no food for the small hybels no bee bread and a relatively small amount of honey just to prop them up there all right uh, here so I see an egg you said you see do you see egg. eggs so all of the cells here, they have eggs. They're like tiny white grains of rice at the bottom of the cell. You can see them against the dark background there. Well, see all of these white things at the bottom. Okay, these are eggs. Okay. okay, this hive is really low on the reserve, so I will give some honey on light colored comb with no bee bread uh, on Monday. Mm. Beetles. Yeah, beetles. <coughs> is there a reason the corner of that foundation is gone? Is yeah, it just broke off. Okay. Uh, I used seconds yeah. and broken pieces are for lots of the frames.
When you put them back, do they always have to face the same way? Yeah, I like them facing the same way, mm -hmm. uh, especially all for the brute frames. Mm -hmm. Do you mark your frames then? Yes, yeah, a very good question. Uh, what I do when I go through a big hive and if I want to maintain the orientation of the frames uh, the same way when taking them out and putting them in, I will run my pencil against the tow bars in one corner, like putting a line across all of them. This way by looking at it I know which orientation it was, especially if I keep turning the frame several times. Well that's all for today's episode. I have so much footage that I thought I'd go ahead and break up this uh, beekeeping journey. Uh, into two episodes. So this was part one. Uh, part two, what I'm going to show is a little bit of uh, Dr. Leo again uh, talking to the students in his workshop. He's got a nice uh, bee workshop, a lot like mine. Uh, mine needs a little bit of TLC right now. I've got a, a lot of building going on uh, uh, for next year because I want to double the size of my apiary. I've got 20 hives now and the lands uh, hive management system is so easy and so uh, it's not it doesn't take very much time to manage your lands hive so it's easy to double or triple the size of your apiary without making that much time commitment to them so if you're thinking about doing the lands hive system that's one of the key features that you're going to really appreciate is that it takes very little time um, because you, it's just one big box. You're not adding supers you, and, and keeping a close eye in the spring, for, especially during the buildup, to make sure that you have your supers there in time. And if you don't get them there in time, your bees swarm. The land system is so much easier for beekeepers, whether you're experienced or whether you're just starting out. So this is uh, just something that I'm sharing with you um, because I think this is going to really help you uh, enjoy your beekeeping journey. So until next time, friends, um, uh, enjoy beekeeping. If you, like the, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up so other people can check it out. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. So we'll see you next time, friends. Enjoy beekeeping.